folks, Matthew Weiss here, weissadvice.com. Before jumping into this video, I want to mention that I will be restructuring the YouTube channel. Normally on Mondays, I dedicate that to a technique. However, I'm modifying it so that we are going to be discussing just some work that I've done, maybe a few interesting things in a record that I can point out that you can then use for your own records, your own mixes, and just adapt very quickly. Uh, Tuesdays is going to be a back to basics day where I point out a simple technique or a simple signal processor and just give you better ways to use it, revisit those basic ideas so we can be more efficient. Wednesday, I will be reintroducing my product review day. I did this at the very beginning of the launch of the channel, dropped it for a while, now I'm bringing it back. And of course, Philosophy Friday is still going to be happening. It will be exactly the same because I love it, you love it, we all love it. Let's rock. All right. This record is called Tractor Beam. I'm bringing it up. It's a little bit of an older record, but I want to point it out because this was just picked up for the movie Clerks 3. Congratulations to the artist Megaran. He is a longtime friend as well as longtime client. Very, very happy for him. And I will provide a link to the record in the description below. But let's check out a little bit of this record and break down what's going on. There's a few interesting things that are worth pointing out for sure. <laughs> If I had a tractor beam, I would use it to bring you right back to me. And I fix everything unsatisfactory. So let me just get one more try. Alright, so first of all, anytime I'm pointing out things that I am doing, I always want to be sure to point out some of the things that I'm not doing, because I think one of the problems with tutorials on YouTube is that we show what we do, right? It wouldn't make sense to show what we don't do, but it kind of does, because it's really important to acknowledge that not everything always needs a lot. So for example, this startup noise that very first thing you hear, there's no processing on it. We have an ARP that also plays in the background that has no processing on it. And then a lot of these elements, like the percussions and things like that, really don't have a lot of processing. Maybe a hair of EQ, maybe something like that. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I'll try things and it won't work. There's an example of that in this record. I can't remember off the top where it was, but if I can remember it, I'll be sure to point it out. All right. First of all, I want to point out what's going on with the kick drum and drum loop here. We've got this main drum loop. And I'm sort of of the mindset when it comes to drums that if we can't figure it, trigger it. So I wanted there to be more attack on that kick and I wanted there to be a stereo image for the clap. So I'm adding two triggers to this. The first is going to be a top kick. So it's being triggered by the kick drum. I isolated it with Sound Radix drum leveler here. And so I'm adding that kind of percussive snap layer, that sort of weird zappy noise to the top of the kick. It's just a little bit of texture to kind of help the, the ear identify the kick. And it, I also felt like it was in character with the song. So that was the reasoning for that. The other thing is that we've got this clap that's hitting only on the left side. And while I'm not opposed to having those two and four kind of percussions like snares and claps land on one side, I almost feel like I would rather have it more extreme to the side or right in the center. And there's a few techniques that we can do for that, but I thought it would be cool to have a stereo image of that clap. So I found a similar clap and I triggered it and I panned it to the right. And then just layered it in. And that really brings the, the whole kit together. That's what makes the drums kind of work. Without those, it sounds like this. Which is all right, but it doesn't really quite feel right. Then with the layers, it sounds like this. Ba-ba-ba-dee-ah. 
And that makes it one of those things where the drums don't feel like they've exactly changed, but somehow they're just a little bit more alive. And I really like that because I find that particularly in hip hop, producers are pretty deliberate about their choice of drums. So I don't like to make dramatic changes unless it really, really calls for it for some reason. Uh, next, I want to talk about the vocal. I think that the vocal is kind of interesting because of what I ultimately end up doing in the end. I think that it's worth just going through the process of playing the before and after vocal just so we can kind of hear where it started versus where it ended up. If I had a track to be, I would use it to bring you right back to me. And I fix everything unsatisfactory. So that's just raw how it was tracked in, and it's not bad. It's pretty good. I would say, you know, it's a little bit bland feeling, but that's kind of how a lot of tracking feels. Uh, you put up a microphone that complements and, and gives you a neutral presentation of the voice if you don't have a specific idea going into it, and you just get the best capture you can, and then in post you figure out how to spice it up. So let me solo this up for you so we can hear it a little better, and then I'll walk through some of the process of getting this vocal to sit right. If I had a tractor beam, I would use it to bring you right back to me. So there's a couple of tone curve things that I want to adjust. And then there's also some pretty wild dynamics from time to time that I want to tame down. And just lastly, it feels like a little bit on the clean side. I kind of want to dusty it up, give it a little bit of personality and pop. So let's start with the EQ here. This is very basic stuff, really. I'm just bringing up some tops, cutting some of the mids that I don't like. And uh, it looks like I was messing around, maybe turned up like half a dB at around the base of the vocal. If I had a tractor beam, I would use it to bring you right back to me. Then I've got some like weird, crazy stuff going on. I, I think I was messing with something over here, but this, this is not actually in. This is just something I was messing with. Uh, same thing with this. This is not in. But there was this weird thump noise that was coming from the headphone bleed. That's what's cutting this. And then there's a couple little spots in the mid-range that occasionally get a little too resonant. And so I have dynamic EQs that are just grabbing those from time to time. If I had a tractor beam, I would use it to bring you right back to me. It's basically just controlling the mids is really the main thing going on there. Now we get into our compression, and I actually have two compressors. This technique is called serial compression. It's where you use multiple compressors to do the lifting. This way, neither compressor is overworking. We don't tend to hear compression too clearly unless it's like over swinging, and then it feels like there's something that's like choking the vocal down. This allows us to get a little bit more compression going with none of that effect. So the first thing I'm using is Arvox. Um, I've been using this one for years. It just works. But you'll notice that I'm not using a ton of it. If I had a tractor beam, I would use it to bring you right back to me. Typically about 3 dB. Some vocals I'll be doing more, some less. It really depends. I'm also gating out some of the noise because there was some headphone bleed going on. But basically only around like 3 or 4 dB of gain reduction at any given point. Then I've got another compressor right afterwards, and I'm using a fairly fast attack. Now a lot of the times on my vocals I'm using much slower attacks, but in this particular case I'm really just trying to control these largest peaks that are kind of slipping through the cracks of Arvox, and so that's why I'm, I'm using the faster attack time here. If I had a tractor beam, I would use it to bring you right back to me. So that's just really grabbing the peaks. And again, it's not even doing 4 dB of gain reduction. It's really only doing about two to maybe three at any given time. One thing I do notice though, is that some of the mids, like some of the lower mids become a little bit more activated once this compressor kicks on. If I had a tractor beam, I would use it to bring you right back to me. I would use it to bring you right back to me. Like I hear that tone come forward a little bit here. So probably a little EQ afterwards. Sometimes we compress things and stuff that we EQ'd out becomes a little bit more uh, in our face again. Before I did that, I ended up using Decapitator to add a little bit of tone and texture to it. I would use it to bring you right back to me. And I fix everything unsatisfactory. Decapitator can be a pretty strong plugin. So this one is really 
in the very like lightest stages, but it's like if you start to hear it, you're in the realm of distortion. If you kind of just feel it and you feel like a color show up, then you're in the realm of saturation. So I wanted to keep this more in the realm of saturation. I wanted to make it feel like we were cooking the, the console a little bit or, you know, the imaginary console, I guess, and get that vibe, not so much like a, like a we're hitting a fuzz pedal kind of a thing. A little bit of EQ, cleaning up some of the low-end stuff that came up. There's that, this one here, three, 350 hertz is kind of that tone that I was pointing out before. And then I guess a little bit of bass popped up as well. So we're just cleaning up some of the lows. I would use it to bring you right back to me. And I fix everything unsatisfactory. And then lastly, I ended up emptying out some more of the mid-range. And I will say this. One of the things that I've been doing this year is watching my mid-cuts. I tend to over-clean things a little bit. So this is how the mi you will hear the mix when you hear it. And it's got this 4 dB cut at around 500 hertz. I would use it to bring you right back to me. Which has this effect of exaggerating the highs and lows. However, if I were to do this today, I would probably use a much smaller cut, and I would probably not do really nearly as much boost. I would use it to bring you right back to me. Uh, boost meaning makeup gain, just to keep that solidity in the mid-range. So that's something that I kind of wish I had done better. Once I had all of those things going, I think I did a lot of this work in solo, which is generally speaking a no-no. So once I got it into the context of the mix, it sounds like this. I would use it to bring you right back to me. And I fix everything unsatisfactory. But I felt like it was too big for the record. Sometimes in order to make everything big, you need to make something small. And we we don't often include the lead vocal in that. We frequently will make the lead vocal as big as we can, but you do have to remember that a vocal is still an element in a mix, and sometimes it's important to kind of control that vocal. So I, uh, I've i got VMR going on here. Ah, here's one of the things that I tried and did not do. I tried running this through a mic emulator, a ribbon mic emulator, as a way of controlling the highs and lows, of softening the top. However, it created too much of a tone and texture that I didn't care for. This is not really the way this mic modeling is intended at all. So it didn't really work out the way that I hoped. So I went to the old fashioned way of doing it, which is simply using an EQ. So I'm shoving off 4 dB from 20 Hertz. Mind you, 20 Hertz is very, very high up. It's way above where the vocal really lives. So while a 4 dB cut to the top end might be a lot for an overall balanced vocal, because it's coming from so high up, it ends up feeling a little bit more gentle than it looks. And then similarly, I'm taking down uh, some from 300 as well. So I'm basically softly band limiting the vocal overall. So here's the before and after. I would use it to bring you right back to me. And I fix everything unsatisfactory. I would use it to bring you right back to me. And I fix everything unsatisfactory. So let me just... And once I do that, it allows for all of the sparkly stuff, all the hi-hats, everything like that, to really just pop through and take over the top end of this mix, which is what I was intending to do with it. I kind of wanted to have a more sort of retro vibe, and that felt a little bit more in line with the intention of the record. So the last thing that I want to point out here that I think is interesting is that I have a single backup vocal uh, provided here, and it sounds like this. Track the beam! All right, so it's just mono up the center. However, because we were in the chorus, I felt like we needed a slightly bigger sound. So after some EQ and some messing around, I am also using... Where is the delay? Track the beam! One of these is causing a delay somehow. Where is it? There it is. It was hiding. All right, so I'm delaying one side by 22 milliseconds, and that's creating something called a Haas split, or the Haas effect, where we suddenly start hearing it coming from two different speakers. It creates it in stereo. We're a little outside of that like main Haas zone. The main Haas zone is usually like under 20 milliseconds, where it just sounds like one sound that somehow spreads across the stereo field. Here, we can actually almost identify it as two separate sounds. Track the beam! 
but like not quite. So it's a little bit in that gray area, which is kind of what I wanted. I wanted it to almost feel like two different dubs, like a doubler more or less. And uh, I have a little bit of modulation on this right hand side as well. So that's going to very slightly vary the pitch, which is effectively how a doubler works. It's a time and pitch variation that makes one thing sound like two separate things. So I'm doing that as like a brute force way of creating a second double that I kind of wish had been there to begin with, but just wasn't. And attract the beat. I would use it to bring you right back to me. So I think that's a good place to wrap up. If you dig this video, hit that like button. If you want to catch more videos like this, hit subscribe with the notification so you get notified. Like I said before, congratulations to Mega Ran. The link to that song will be in the description below. And if you happen to be watching Clerks 3, take a listen for it because it's in there somewhere. Uh, I don't know where yet. I haven't seen it yet. Anyway, you know what we say. We are musicians. Sound is our instrument. And I will catch you next time.